Hello, my name is Sheila and I would like to welcome you to my podcast All About You. I love to listen to podcasts and especially conversations with famous people. However, I think everyone has a story to tell. Maybe a place you have visited, a hobby you enjoy or anything that you feel would be of interest. I want to have conversations with lots of different people and hear their stories. So if you have a story to tell, please contact me on my email allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com. So welcome to the All About You podcast and today we have another Q&A and my guest is John from Wales in Somerset in the UK. So John, welcome to the All About You podcast. Thank you. So John, do you listen to podcasts? No, never have. Ah, so you might be a new recruit to the world of podcasting. (laughs) Possibly. Do you even know what a podcast is? Probably not definitively, no. Okay. Well, podcasting is generally, it's a bit like a radio program. Anybody can make a podcast and you can make a podcast on virtually any subject you can think of. So if you're into football, you're into nutrition, you're having a baby, you're into fashion, psychology, there are so many podcasts out there and they are free to listen to. So there's lots of platforms to listen to, Google, Spotify, iTunes. So hopefully this will be your first introduction to podcasting. So, John, your first question, do you read a lot? Not, not a huge amount, no. I used to, but now, now I've retired. I don't seem to have the time for it. Right. So if you're retired and you're not reading as much, how are you spending your time? Um, it's usually out of the workshop. I have a woodturner's workshop. Right. So wood turning. What is wood turning? It's making objects which generally, but not always, are round from wood on a lathe. I'm imagining you get part of a tree trunk. Yep. And you somehow put it in the machine. You generally tend to have two points that you stick into either end of the bit of wood and then turn it um, generally speaking you would turn a tenon on one end and then put it into a chuck so that it's held more securely right so somebody who knows nothing about wood turning my first question is where do you get the wood from you can get it anywhere. You can buy prepared blanks, which is obviously quite expensive. Um, you can contact tree surgeons who generally are happy to get rid of the wood, although these days more and more of them are getting used to the fact that we want wood, so they'll charge but less than a, a wood yard or a craft shop would. So then, I mean, generally speaking, for me personally, uh, a friend and I take down and process quite a few trees. So you go and cut your own trees down? Yes, sometimes. Sometimes they've come down in storms, in which case we just cut them up and then take the wood back. And, of course, because it's general, that is generally green wood or wet wood, then we have to allow them to season before we can use the wood, but that's done by cutting it smaller so that it dries quicker and then allowing it to air dry. So John, how did you get into wood turning? Where where did this come from, this this activity? Well, I've always always liked woods and forests and trees, um, like getting out into the woods, and it started off with a course at Western Burt Arboretum of turning specifically green wood on an old technology lathe. It's, a, it's called a pole lathe, and it's powered by a treadle. So you power it yourself. And because for that you use very, very fresh wood, you can turn it quite easily. It's almost like turning a candle. You know, it's, it's that easy. 
as long as your tools are sharp and you've got enough power to press the treadle, you, you're away. And from that, I then went on to power turning, which is more flexible in the sense that you can turn dry wood, which you couldn't on a pole lathe. So did you go to classes to learn how to do all this? Not classes, no. I've had um, three three experiences of green woodworking in the, in the woods, which is obviously very serene, you know, is it nice and quiet, peaceful. Um, and then I started to get the equipment for power turning. And I've had a, a few lessons from people, classes in the sense that I go repetitively to somebody, but a day's tuition. And I've done that several times. But it's a, it's a, a marvellous world in the fact that people share, that there are no trade secrets, it seems. You know, that people are more than happy to tell you how they do something and, if necessary, where and how you're going wrong. So you can improve your technique. And, of course, like anything, practice helps. So, so I think, then, if, if you've got people who uh, themselves enjoy working with wood, they are more than happy to teach somebody else who has got an interest in that, and then it's a match made in heaven. Absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, it, it tends to be an old man's sport, if you like, um, because it's it demands a certain amount of outlay. So it tends to be older, retired people or people that have been bitten by the bug. Um, so we're constantly trying to attract new members to the clubs. There are a lot of regional clubs around the country, some internet based ones these days, but it's getting new blood in. So you say you have a workshop. So is this a converted garage? No, my first one was. Uh, this one's purpose built. It's not particularly big. I mean, although the dimensions would say to you that it is. It's five metres by two and a half. Um, but believe me, once you get the equipment and the benches and stuff, you soon eat up space. But it's, it's a truism to say that you, you will always fill the available space. So I imagine that you start off with basic equipment and then as you progress in your ability, you're then upgraded the equipment? Often that's the case. Um, if you're in the, the fortunate position of being bitten by the bug before you get kid, then obviously, like anything, you, you buy the best you can afford because it means you, you replace it less frequently and certainly longer down the line. You, you would actually save money by doing it that way. It will cost you more in the, in the first instance, but over time you will be saving money. So if, if people want to get involved in wood turning, how, how would they find out about where to, where to go to? If you, you, can, you can Google wood turning clubs. So if you think you've got an interest for it, Google wood turning instructors, have a lesson, see how you enjoy it, how you get on. That person will often recommend a club that they belong to, go along and watch demonstrations by people see the work that the club members have turned out and you go from there. So John, what do you do with all the things you make and what, what sort of things are you making? Oh, I, I make anything, um, bowls, plates or platters, decorative items, candlesticks, pepper mills. You can, you can do almost anything that lends itself to being turned round, you can make. So that could be a sphere. Or a cylinder. Do you sell these things, John? I have sold a few. Um, it it tends to be word of mouth. Um, somebody that you know will want something. Uh, a lady I I know that I used to work with. She she wanted some clay presses, which are very much like a um, a bowl with a handle on the back end, and she uses it to form bowls out of clay. But yeah, so I mean, people might see work on Instagram and say, "Can I, can I buy that?" Or you can, you can. I don't, but you can go to shows and demonstrate, you know, demonstrate either your work 
or how you work. Uh, so yes, I've sold a few, but it, it's one one item's been via the internet, the other word, word of mouth, you know, friends and things like that, family of course. I suppose they they start to hate Christmas and birthdays, thinking they're going to get another bomb. So I mean, I, I guess I can understand if you go to like a county show or something like that, you will have artesian people showing the things they've made for example like your bowls and plates and things so do you not want to get involved in in that type of uh, event to sort of display and maybe sell your your items i don't think i'm good enough there, there's still r definitely room for improvement but then you would probably always say that anyway um the other thing is is the outlay it's, it's not cheap to set up a stall in the show and you tend to have to go for two or three days possibly and of course you need a stock um, and although I, I turn nearly every day I don't have a huge stock of bowls I would have to get a lot more proficient uh, including speedy to, to be able to turn the stock I need. So I imagine if you're going to a show as you say you would have to spend a lot of time in the months before in, in producing a selection of items to take and then maybe where you're just enjoying it as a hobby and, and doing it for pleasure now, it would become a time-sensitive activity. Yes, it could easily do that. And I don't want to be in a position of having to do it. I enjoy it. I enjoy it thoroughly. But of course, as you say, if it becomes an occupation, then there's a lot more pressure on you, not, not least probably through the inland revenue. Well, yes, that's true. So do you find it quite a relaxing hobby, working with sort of nature and creating things? Do you find that relaxing? Yes. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it can be a little fraught at the time of doing it. You know, if you've got something which is either big or out of balance or not held securely yet, then it, it you know, it can be a bit worrying to start with, but it's all consuming. It's a little bit like fishing in that sense, in that you you concentrate totally on what you're doing and time just goes. I mean, the word that springs to mind listening to this conversation is patience. I should imagine it's something that you have to go slowly, you have to go carefully, and I should imagine there is a safety aspect. Do you have to wear protective clothing? Yes, I wear a mask, a, a helmet, I suppose, it's got built-in air filtration, which it filters down to a very low level. So it takes all the dust away from your lungs. And it's a positive pressure thing, so it blows air over your face inside a mask so that the, the air inside is always slightly higher pressure than the air outside, so the, air, the, the dust doesn't get into the mask. Uh, it's also a bump cap and the visor is impact resistant. So a three pound lump of wood comes off the lathe at 1500 RPM. You're going to feel it anyway, but it's going to mitigate it. Has that ever happened to you? Oh yeah, well, not that big, no. But yes, I've had things come off the lathe. It's almost a pastime. It tends to be either at the beginning or the end where you've got a much lighter hold on the piece. Okay, so hence the safety equipment. Yes. You have to have the workshop, you have to have the equipment, and then you need the, the safety equipment as well. Yeah, the safety equipment, it's, it's not insignificant in price, but it's probably one of the cheaper items. Certainly, if you consider your long-term health, you, you, can't, you can't put too high a price on that. Um, I mean, I've, I've got breathing problems anyway, generally, so push the message home that you need to look after yourself so, John, you said at the beginning you think it's an activity for sort of retired people. Do you think there are many women in wood turning? There are a few. There, there are some very well-known ones in, in, our, in our world, if you like. Like anything, it tends to be male-dominated, which is, I mean, it's completely wrong because the women are as capable. You don't need huge strength to do it, and they're often a lot more artistic than us men. So, John, you say you're retired now. So did you get into wood turning before you retired or was this something on your retirement to do list? No, no, it was before I retired. Um, I've been retired seven years. 
Um, and I suppose I've had a lathe for about 15 years. So it must have been about 15 years ago that I took the first steps in the woods at Westenburg. So you had your wood turn in activity in place before you retired. Do you think a lot of people who are, who may be thinking about retirement, do you think it's important for people to have activities they start before they retire or do you think they should have like a to-do list, when I retire I'm going to do this, that and something else? What do you think? I don't really know. I think if you if you start it before you retire, you're then you're still earning money. So you, you know the the things become slightly more affordable, possibly. Uh, you definitely need something to do once you have retired. You need to keep occupied and active. You hear a lot of people that retire and die in six months because they've got no hobbies, nothing to occupy them. It's easier to get it done or to start while you're working. I, I agree with you. I remember having a conversation probably 20 years ago now with a lady I used to work in an office. And she probably had about two years before she had planned to retire. And she had got herself involved in so many things. She was in the drama group. She was in her local allotment. She started volunteering. And I remember having a conversation and she was saying, I want all these things in place to be established and then when I retire I can spend more time doing all these different things. I've built the relationship, I've established the activity and I've never forgotten that conversation and I thought that was really interesting because I think sometimes some people say when I retire I will fill in the blanks and I sometimes think maybe try and do something on a smaller scale because obviously if you are working so you do have the activity and the relationships in place before you retire and then you can just amplify those when you retire absolutely yes and i mean it, it's become a truism that you often hear people say that they didn't know how they had time to work hopefully those are the sorts of people that maybe have longer doing it than others and I'm the same you know th when I try and think of fitting work in around what I'm doing now as a hobby I, I just couldn't do it. I think that's the secret to a happy retirement though isn't it the fact that you you have you are getting up at a certain time in the morning because you want to get into the workshop or you're going to your exercise class or you're meeting friends for coffee or you're volunteering or something absolutely yeah you, it gives you something to do i mean I, I i don't get up as early as i could having worked shift work all my life i i find that a lie-in is is um desirable certainly you don't regulate your life as well as you do if, if you had a job so do you have quite a routine to your day though now do you you say you don't get up as early, but do you have lunch at a certain time or do you stop for coffee mid-morning or something? Not really, no. Um, I'm usually up up and about by nine o'clock. That tends to be the latest. Start doing some chores, you know, so maybe the dishwasher, make the coffee, that sort of thing. But then generally speaking, it's breakfast and as soon as I can, it's out into the workshop. And, and I think for a lot of people... The retirement age is, is looking further and further into the future. I think with the economy, retirement age is just going to change. And I think maybe for grandchildren, there will not be a retirement age. What advice would you give to somebody who is thinking about retirement and thinking about how they're going to fill those days? Is there anything you would have done differently before you retired? I don't, um, I don't think there's anything I would have done differently. Um, retirement was slightly forced on me through health reasons. Um, so it was, it was slightly earlier than it, you might have expected it to be. As a general concept, I think try and get interested in something that you think you like prior to retiring. You know, and as you say, get, get things in place. It does make it slightly more affordable. You know what you're going to be doing. And it gives you it gives you something to look forward to, because obviously when you retire, you you lose a lot 
And I won't just talk about the income, but your circle of friends is probably going to decline somewhat. Uh, so you need to know that you've got, although you'll probably make other friends in different fields, you need to keep your good friends close. Some people will give you the opportunity to let them slide. Others will do the exact opposite and you know you've got a good friend for life. But keep in touch socially and and start to get active after the you know in preparation for the retirement so that when that comes you're looking forward to it i mean otherwise if you've got nothing you almost you could almost dread retirement i think that's a very valid point as well and i think reading articles about retirement a lot of people have a bit of an identity crisis because while they're working in their job they are they're a manager they're sales they're a teacher they're this they're that when you retire you go back to being just who you are you're you're not i'm i'm fred smith the the sales director and i think for a lot of people when you step away from that environment and it's just you i think it's the identity because I noticed when I first came to Spain and, and met a lot of people, it, it was like, what do you do? Well, I used to, and uh, well, yes, I used to be, a, and, and they often go back to where they were maybe 10, 15 years ago, and, and that tends to be their identity rather than, well, this is me now, and this is what I do now, this is who I am now. Yeah, you're a, you're a different person after you retire. I mean, that can, that can work in lots of ways. You know, it can be by being a bigger worrier because you don't have the income or the social circle that you did, but it could also be liberating. And that's very much the way I looked on it at the time. You know, that I'm, I'm free now. I do what I want. And yes, there are other people to consider as well, but you don't have to fit it all in around a job. And if you do like I did, do shift work all your life, that makes that even more difficult so yeah it's a, it's a great time it's a great time to retire so take the hobbies on so do you, do you have any goals for the future i've never been a goal-driven person i mean i want to become better as a wood turner uh, more proficient and that will with that will come being speedier but speed of itself isn't isn't a goal because it's it's the journey if you like you know it's the making of a piece it takes as long as it takes and you just enjoy it at the time as I say you become more proficient i've become a lot more proficient but there's a way to go because with wood turning it it's it's it to me it very much looks like it's a labor of love you're working with in theory a living thing you're creating with your hands and the machinery you're learning it's the patience of working with that item and hopefully producing a thing of beauty that you or others can enjoy so i can, i imagine this is quite a relaxing and a meditative activity am i am i right yes yeah you are yeah it, it is relaxing and you can take a certain pride in what you've done but because you're working with something that very recently was living, you've got to take care with it because if you don't, it'll just crack. And I mean, all right, there's, I mean, bowls with cracks and holes in do have a certain character, but they immediately lose the, the appeal to some people because they're not usable. I, I think this is a very interesting point because when you're working with, for example, a piece of natural wood, that wood has got its history, it's got its natural flaws. Working with something that bringing out the beauty of those natural flaws, because obviously we are, we tend in our life, anything that has a flaw, we reject. But when we look at the flaws in Mother Nature... Celebrate the flaws. Yeah. yeah they, they are part of the character, and why try and hide that? And, and I think particularly when you do see people have made, as you say, a bowl or a wooden plate, the different colours of the wood as it runs through it, the, the lines in the wood, um, the knots, 
absolutely beautiful when it's all polished up and, and it can be in the center of the plate it can be on the side of a plate absolutely each piece is unique you know you can make the same shape time after time after time and there are people that do that you know production turners they, they'll produce bowls there's some excellent workers in that sense and as I say the shapes are all the same or very very similar but each piece of wood is totally different so John, I've got a couple of random questions for you now. So what is your most favourite place that you have ever visited? I was going to say without doubt there's only one choice, but immediately two spring to mind. I, I actually I was fortunate enough to live in Singapore for three years during my early teens. And that was a fantastic place to live. I mean, everybody that was there in my circle were there because their father was in the forces. So we, we looked on it with slightly idyllic eyes and I've met nobody or spoken to nobody who didn't enjoy their time and misses it terribly. But then you're looking on it from the point of view of a school child who has maybe six hours work a day and then goes down to the beach or the local swimming pool. But that, that was an excellent time. I've also visited Australia a few times and I absolutely love Western Australia. What is it about Western Australia you like? Well, the first thing is I've got a very good friend who lives there. I used to work with him in Bristol before he emigrated. Um, so he, he's a draw, obviously. The, the place itself, it's so very different to England and Europe. There, there are similarities. It's warm, it's dry, still has trees, so there's still wood turners, but it's got beautiful beaches and sea. Scenery is fantastic. The people are laid back. It's just so long to get there. 24 hours travelling, I mean, that, that that's a fair, uh, fair distance, isn't it? It is. So, John, if you could sit down and have a cup of coffee or a beer with somebody, somebody famous, dead or alive, who would you like to have that conversation with? That's probably on the spot. I haven't got a clue. I suppose it, ignoring people's like statesman, I suppose a very proficient wood turner. There's a chap called Bert Marsh who was very influential in his time and concentrated on very simple shapes, but elegantly and proficiently done. He he's, certainly won. He's like a master. Oh, definitely, yeah. So what would you ask him if you, if you had time with him? Um, I think just the procedural things, you know, sort of, you have to move around the bowl while you're working, if you're making a bowl. It's getting the movements right. So just to, I don't know whether you, I need to ask him or just watch him, because you can learn so much just by watching a master at work. I, I could watch a master in any field and enjoy what they're doing because they're so proficient at it. I should imagine it's one of those things, if you went onto YouTube and put in wood turning, you would find hundreds of videos of people and you could actually watch them with time-lapse photography creating something in, in sort of three or four minutes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I do it fairly regularly, watch people on YouTube. They're very proficient because they're used to doing it all the time. But the, the downside to that is that the view isn't necessarily the best to watch how they're doing something. You can see what they're doing, but not the way they move to do it. And that and that would make the difference in improving the finished article is in their technique. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, getting a smooth cut all the way round a bowl. That's something to be admired. So John, my last question for you. At the moment travel seems a bit of a an embargo for most people at the moment. Is there one country you would like to visit? There's lots of countries I'd like to visit. If we talk about what I haven't been to I would probably say Japan or the States from the scenery point of view, you know, because they're both very different worlds. I suspect you'd get a bit more freedom, if you like, in the States, but freedom from freedom of space to move around and see different scenery. I'd love to, to do something like that. So I get the impression you quite like to be outdoors, looking at different landscapes. Oh, definitely. Yes. So you're more of a country person than a city person? Oh, most definitely. So whereabouts in the States would be your first port of call? Probably somewhere, certainly rolling hills, mountains, 
that sort of thing. So you wouldn't be heading to downtown Miami or New York? No, most definitely not. <laughs> Maybe only in the sense that they've got airports. But I wouldn't stay there very long. So you travel there and then you travel on to somewhere that's quieter and enjoy the scenery. Yes, definitely. John, well, it's been a brilliant conversation and I've, I've really been fascinated listening to about the world of wood turning. And I hope you've enjoyed the conversation too. Yes, I think so. Thank you. Oh, good. Thanks very much, John. I hope you have enjoyed the conversation. Don't forget, if you have a story you would like to tell, please get in touch. My email address is allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and thank you for listening.